welcome to Sunday, October, what, 17th. I'm glad you're joining me here and Pastor Brian here at the Sweet Home Evangelical Church. And we're, we're back in Matthew today. We've been off and on in a series in Matthew. And, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I read a, a Gallup poll uh, that said that only 29% of people in America have a fair amount of trust in the media. And only 7% of Americans have a great deal of trust in the media. And some of you might think that number seems a little high. <laughs> And so the, the, problem, the problem with the lack of trust in media is that somewhere along the way they started playing the political team sports and the media, it's, it, you can see it. Uh, they used to hide it a little bit, but you can see it now. And when someone in the media interviews somebody who's on their team, the questions are things like, what is your favorite flavor of ice cream and how did you get to be such a wonderful person? Uh, and when the media interviews somebody on the other team, the questions are, why are you such a horrible person and when did you stop beating your wife? I mean, you know, they, it's, uh, and, and the problem is we are trapped in this prison of two teams and there's only two teams and it's one or the other and you got to be on one side or the other and it's just uh and the reason we're trapped in this prison of only two choices is because human beings they like nice easy answers uh they don't really want to read and learn and do research and think through things uh, because there's you know a lot of different opinions and ideas along the way and it's quite nuanced no, it's just we're, we're pretty simple creatures. And so we kind of break things down into nice, simple choices. Uh, it's either this or that. Kind of like it's either crunchy peanut butter or creamy peanut butter. Either ducks or beavers, dogs or cats, Coke or Pepsi. We like nice, simple conclusions that we can jump to quickly. And, and we're back in the book of Matthew for a bit, and we're looking at some, a familiar section of the Bible. We're starting in chapter 13, and we're going to be here for a little bit. And, and there are some parables and some that you may have heard before, and it's, it's easy to jump to some nice, simple conclusions. But maybe, just maybe, the story is a little more complicated than we think. We're in Matthew 13 today, and, and earlier in Matthew, there was the uh, Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, 6, 7. We did a big series last summer, and uh, this is what I am calling the Sermon on the Boat. Uh, so we see this in Matthew chapter 13. It says in verse 1, Later that same day, Jesus left the house and sat beside the lake. A large crowd soon gathered around him, so he got into a boat. Then he sat there and taught as the people stood on the shore. He told many stories in the form of parables, such as this one. Okay, so everybody shows up. And they're, they're, you know, Jesus did a lot of ministry uh, oh, up, up in the northern part of Israel next to this good-sized lake that we call the Sea of Galilee. Capernaum was kind of home base for him. That was uh, Peter and Andrew's hometown. And uh, Jesus shows up. There's a lot of people there by the lake. And so he gets into a boat. Maybe the boat belonged to Peter or James and John or whatever. And, and so everybody's on the shore and Jesus is down, kind of like a natural amphitheater type of thing. And he starts preaching from the boat. Now, this is why I want to call this the Sermon on the Boat. Uh, there are no theologians that call this the Sermon on the Boat. I think we need to start it, okay? Uh, but uh, Jesus, that's how the Sermon on the Mount got its name. Jesus went up on a mountain, started preaching, Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is in a boat, starts preaching. So here we have the Sermon on the Boat. And there's several parables. And so we're going to be in parables here the next few weeks. And the a definition of a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. 
It's somewhere between an illustration and an allegory. Uh, you got these stories that Jesus would tell, and, and he had these parables he would tell. And when we look at the Bible, it wasn't a modern society. They didn't have stockbrokers and baristas and computer software engineers. Uh, they had fishermen and carpenters, shepherds and farmers. And so when we look at the Bible, we kind of need to be ready for some metaphors about farmers, about things they would see in their day. And, oh, my word, I'm noticing on the, on, the, on the video, I'm just taking a little break here. I just had a cyst removed from my arm, and so it hurts. So I'm being real careful about how I move my arm while I'm talking, and that's okay, okay? Uh, anyway, we're looking at famous parable today. Today's parable, it's got a couple different names. Uh, it's called the parable of the soil or the parable of the sower or the farmer scattering the seed. Uh, we're talking about dirt today. Uh, remember this parable, there's four different kinds of dirt. And Jesus has this parable of the dirt. So I'm going to read this from Matthew 13, uh, middle of verse 3. Jesus says, listen, a farmer went out to plant some seeds. As he scattered them across the field, some seeds fell on the footpath. And the birds came and ate them. Other seeds fell on the shallow soil uh, with underlying rock. The seeds sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow. But the plants soon wilted under the hot sun, and since they didn't have deep roots, they died. Other seeds fell among the thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants. Still other seed fell on the fertile soil, and they produced a crop that was either 30, 60, and even 100 times as much as had been planted. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Okay, so this parable is, well, actually, it's the only thing recorded from the Sermon on the Boat. Then it says that they went on and did other things. But um, this this uh, parable here, Jesus talks about this, and the disciples, you know, they have this talk about, you know, why do you talk in parables? And then we get down to verse 18, where Jesus explains the parable. He says in verse 18, now listen to the explanation of the parable about the farmer planting seeds. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message about the kingdom and don't understand it. Then the evil one comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in their hearts. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy, but since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or, the pers or are persecuted for believing God's word. The seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth, uh, so no fruit is produced. The seed that fell on good soil represents those who truly hear and understand God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, even 100 times as much as had been planted. Okay, lots of sermons have been preached on this parable. Uh, you probably heard some sermons preached on this parable. The human mind likes some nice, simple answers. So most sermons that get preached on this parable go along something along the lines of the seed that's scattered on the footpath, on that hard soil. Uh, those are the bad people. Those are bad people, kind of like the Taliban, okay? They are, you know, bad people. They don't listen to the Word of God. And then the seed that's scattered on the good soil, well, that's us because we go to church on Sunday morning. So that would be us. We're good people. And the seed that's scattered on the rocky and thorny soil, those are people who used to go to church, but they don't go to church here anymore. Now, that's a very simple answer, but it may or may not be true. Maybe it's a little more complicated than this. When studying the Bible, context is everything. What happens before this story of the four different kinds of dirt is incredibly important to the story. Uh, the uh, Gospel of Matthew and also the Gospel of Mark, too. They have an event take place right before this parable. So you read along this event, and then you got this parable, and, and it, you know, the, the Gospel writers, the Bible is telling you these things kind of go together. 
And so what's happening right before this? At the end of chapter 12, Jesus is teaching. There's a big crowd around him. He had crowds a lot. And somebody says to Jesus, hey, uh, you, you know, his, your family's here. Uh, Jesus' mom and, and brothers show up, and somebody comes and tells Jesus, hey, Jesus, your mom and your brothers are here. And what does Jesus say? Matthew 12, verse 48, Jesus uh, asked, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Okay, now, did Jesus have memory issues? Did he forget who his mom and brothers were? No, that's not what's happening. Jesus is making a point here. And he points to his disciples, and then he says, these are my mother and my brothers, which I think would have made Peter feel a bit awkward when Jesus walks up to him and says, this is my mother. And uh, that's, that's a bit awkward, but Jesus is trying to make a point here. Now, I, I know of a church that ripped this verse way out of context, and they push that your family is no longer important. You need to ignore your family because your first priority is to those in the church. And that's, that's not exactly what Jesus is saying here. Jesus says in verse 50, chapter 12, verse 50, right at the end of chapter 12, right before this, uh, the Sermon on the Boat, uh, Jesus says, anyone who does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Jesus is saying that being part of the family of God, it, it doesn't depend on your DNA. Jewish people at his time, they all felt like it all depends on your family and your DNA. That's the family of God is just us here. And Jesus says, no, it doesn't really depend on, you, on who you are related to or connected to. Being part of the family of God is, is about doing the will of God the Father. Matthew and Mark, they both have this event take place, and then they follow it up with this parable of the dirt. We've always thought of this parable of the four soils as how uh, there's four soils, so one-fourth of the people listen to God and they get saved, and three-fourths don't. But this parable isn't entirely about salvation. This section of the Bible is about doing the will of God the Father. So when we look at these four different soils, the question for us today is, are we doing the will of God the Father? Are we really part of the family of God? And ha what has God called you to do? Uh, now, you may trust in him for salvation and a home in heaven. You are wonderful people. You're watching some preacher online, and, uh, you know, you are good folks here. Uh, but the question for us individually is, are we doing the will of God the Father? Are you spending time in God's Word? Are you spending time with God's people? Are you spending time in prayer? Are you showing God's love to everybody in your life? Have you got, given up that bad habit that God's been reminding you to do? Have you forgiven that person who hurt you deeply? Are you listening more to your fears or to your faith? Are you doing God's will in every area of your life? Like Jesus said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like the wise man who built his house upon the rock, okay? How do we put into practice and be ready to do God's will, which is what it means to be a part of the family of God? How are we ready to do God's will? How do we... How, how do we be identified as Jesus' family, mother, brothers, and sisters? How do we do God's will? Okay, now we're up to the outline. Number one, you need to plow the ground. You need to plow the ground. Verse uh, 19, the seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message about the kingdom but don't understand it when the evil one comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in their hearts. 
Did you catch that? This is hard ground. It's a kind of a footpath. People have walked on it, so it's hard. It's not plowed up soil. These are not people who have willfully turned from God. They just don't understand it. They received God's word, but they just don't get it. I, a week and a half ago, I was in Canada. Uh, uh, my, uh, saw my in-laws up there. It was great. My in-laws are living in, ah, it's not really a retirement center, but it's, it's condos where you have to be retirement age to move in there. And, uh, and it's built right on the college campus uh, where my wife and I went to college, uh, where her parents both went to college there too. And, and so there's a few landmarks that are still there from when I was in college over 30 years ago. And every time I go back uh, up there, I, I think about um, college age Brian and how there's so much I didn't know. And there's times where I, I wonder, you know, if, if only I knew then what I know now. Right? Have you ever thought about that? If only I knew then what I know now. And the problem is when you're young, you just, you don't know and you, you're struggling to figure out life. And you get along, if you, you get along better when you, you, you're ready to hear from people, to hear from God, but also to hear wisdom from other people too. Uh, and, and, but when you're young, you're just not thinking that way. If we're to do God's will, we need to prepare our minds so we are ready to hear from God. There are some things I wish I, my mind would have been ready to hear from people. They probably said it. I just wasn't listening back then. Uh, the human mind just, it's not really prepared to accept something new. Uh, when the mind hears something, it's not prepared to hear. It just automatically closes up it doesn't it doesn't compute and it kind of kicks it out it doesn't matter you know if there somebody is telling you the truth uh, it just doesn't quite compute because you're not ready to hear it and sometimes that's good however sometimes that keeps us from hearing from God uh, we've been reading in the Old Testament prophets this month in the monthly Bible reading plan uh, book of Hosea, towards the end of the book of Hosea, uh, it says, God tells the people, break up the hard ground of your hearts. This is a parable about the hard ground. And back in Hosea, it says, break up the hard ground of your hearts, for now is the time to seek the Lord, that he may come and shower righteousness upon you. God scatters the seed on that hard ground, it, you need to plow up the hard ground of your heart so that you can hear from him. God told the people of Israel to do this, so it, it means that it is something that is humanly possible. The nation of Israel had been pulling further and further away from God. Their hearts were hard, but what did the prophet say? Plow up the ground. What part of you... Well, part of your life, your heart, your mind needs, needs some plowing. We need to prepare our minds so that we are ready and we're actively listening for God's direction so that we can do God's will in our lives. God speaks to those who are ready to do his will. Plow the ground. Number two, we need to pick the rocks. We need to pick out the rocks. After you plow the ground, the next thing you do is to pick the rocks. I've talked to some farmers over the years, and they tell me about picking rocks. Uh, one guy from uh, well, went to college with him. He talks about every year in the spring after the winter, uh, you know, the ground is frozen and the ground starts to thaw, and then there's all these rocks. And he remembers as a kid going out and picking rocks, and uh, sounded like they they grew more rocks than anything else on the farm. And maybe you plowed the ground, but there are some, some rocks that you need to pick out of your life, some stumbling blocks in your life. Uh, verse 20, the seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message, immediately receive it with joy, but since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. 
They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. Some of these rocks are our baggage from our past. Some of these rocks are just our bad habits that keep us from growing deep roots. There are some people, they hear from God and they try to do God's will, but they're not growing in the Lord. Uh, these, these rocks and stumbling blocks and baggage of their past, they sidetrack them and then they just give up. You know, it's the easiest thing in the world to start something. Finishing, that's a different story. The Christian life is compared to a race, not a hundred meter dash. I think even in my old age state here, I think I could do a hundred meter dash and finish it. But life is not a hundred meter dash. It's a marathon. And, and for those who run marathons, it's not about winning. It's about finishing. It's better to finish something than to start something. Uh, back in the old days, before there were digital cameras and all of this, uh, there was a guy that walked into a photography studio with a framed picture of his girlfriend. And he wanted the picture duplicated for some reason, and the, the guy at the studio wasn't quite sure, but, you know, okay. And the owner of the studio says, okay, and you know, come back in a couple days. And, and he removed the picture from the frame. And on the back of the picture, uh, she had written something. And, and uh, the girlfriend wrote, my dearest Tom, I love you with all my heart. I love you more every each day. I will love you forever and ever. I am yours for all eternity. It was signed Diane. And then there was a postscript. P.S. If we ever break up, I want this picture back. Might be why he was getting a copy. <laughs> Love you with all my heart, but if we ever break up, I want this back. We do that with God, don't we? Oh, God, I love you with all my heart. I love you more and more each day. I'm going to love you forever. But do we always live like that? I remember a sermon preached. 30 years ago, it was a special event. It was over, it was meh, almost 30 years ago. And for some reason it stuck with me and the guy preaching, he, he spoke from Colossians 4.17 and it says, tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the work you have received in the Lord. Finish the work you have started. You've received the word of God and you know what God's will is for your life, but you need to finish that work. You need to pick out the rocks out of the soil so that you can do God's will. In this parable, the seed sprouted. Uh, it sprouted up quickly, but then the sun came out, and because it didn't have roots, it withered away. You need to pick out the rocks of your life so that your roots can grow deeply. The past couple of years have not been easy. This whole COVID life is just craziness. And some people have drawn closer to God in the middle of all this. They have turned to God and drawn closer to God all the more during these difficult times. However, there are other people who have fallen away. They've just given up. They, they fell away because they didn't have roots. They had a bunch of rocks in their life that they didn't pick out. They didn't let their roots grow deep and they were never all that committed to God in the first place. They pledged their eternal love to God, but it lasted about as long as Diane's love for Tom. If we ever break up, I want this picture back. Start picking out the rocks out of your life. Let your roots grow deep and do it today. Number three, we need to pull the weeds. We need to pull the weeds out too. I've got a whole section in my backyard of my house where the grass is basically gone. Uh, the problem is that the weeds got out of hand and they killed off the grass and it's, it's slowly getting better. I think this is the first year it's actually gotten slightly better. But I had to pull out a lot of overgrown weeds and the weeds were such a problem and the grass just died off. Jesus says in verse 22, the seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth, so no fruit is produced. After you've plowed the ground and picked the rocks, 
then you need to pull the weeds. What are those cares and worries of life that you have? We all have those things. I'm, you know, these days now more than ever. Uh, whether it's finances, relationships, travel, job, COVID, government, family, future, whatever. When you dwell on these too long, they tend to grow like weeds. But you know, there's nothing too big for God to handle. This, I've been doing a monthly memory verse. And I don't know how it's going for people in the church, but it's helpful for me anyway. And we have a monthly Bible reading plan, but there's also a memory verse from the Bible reading that month. And the memory verse this month is Micah 7.7, 7, and it says, As for me, I look to the Lord for help. I wait confidently on God to save me, and my God will certainly hear me. We need, to, we need to pull those weeds out of our lives, those cares and worries, because as for me, I look to the Lord for help. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to look to the Lord for help. And that leads us to number four. Finally, we can produce. The seed that fell on good soil represents those who truly hear and understand God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, even 100 times as much as has been planted. You know, we feel that since we're the good people that go to church or watch church online, that, you know, we are the good soil. However, if you're on a farm and you plant seed and not much comes up, there's some sort of problem along the way. Oh, many years ago, before I started pastoring, I worked for Hewlett Packard. We made those ink cartridges for printers, and there was this big production line. I worked towards the end of the line, and um, if we didn't have anything coming out the end of the production line, that meant there was a problem upstream somewhere. This whole story of the dirt, it's, it isn't a story about how there are bad people and good people. This is a parable of how we move from being hard-hearted to being a person who is part of the family of God and doing God's will. To do that, we need to plow up the ground in our lives. We need to be ready to hear from God. We need to pick out the rocks, that emotional baggage of our past, those things that are keeping us from our roots growing deeply in the Lord. We need to pull out the weeds, those cares and worries of life, so that we can stay focused on God. And then, and only then, can we expect to live a productive Christian life doing God's will. If you've plowed the ground, picked out the rocks, pulled the weeds, and you're doing God's will, God will bless you far beyond what you can imagine. Let me pray for you. Lord God, we thank you that you have blessed us. Lord, help us to do your will. Lord, help us to not just assume that we're the good people and the good soil, but that we can actually work at it and continue to be good farmers, to continue to plow the ground so that we are always ready to hear from you, to pull out the rocks so that we can grow our roots deeply in you, that we can pull the weeds, get away, get these cares and worries of the world away from us. Lord God, I pray that for myself. Pray that for each one watching today. Whoever they are, wherever they are, that you would be with them in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Lord bless you. Thanks for joining me. Have a great day. Bye-bye.